Thank you so much. Uh, you talk about gamification. That's very important, very interesting. And also the methods to increase engagement from different workers and create a new working model. I personally found it very, very interesting. So to develop this concept more right now, let's give them a round of warm applause. Let's welcome today's our panelists on the stage. Uh, Digital Minister of Taiwan, Audrey Payne, and Eva Chen, CEO of Trend Micro. All right, so I will only have 20 minutes with you two. And then <laughs> the next 25 minutes will be QA sessions for everyone who has a personal, no, not personal, working. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> questions for Audrey or Eva. Can you slide out to raise your questions? And then uh, Audrey and Eva will personally answer your question. All right, so first, let's dig more into the concept and the actual force of DevOps. I understand it has its challenges, its opportunities, and Trend Micro used it very, very well. In terms of uh, specific details, Eva, can you share some of the stellar experience or stellar team that you've observed? Okay, actually, DevOps, the most important thing is that you need to have a quick response and correct response to customer requests, right? That's the most important spirit. But no matter what platform, what uh, technology you use, that's the end goal you want to achieve. Right. And I think uh, in the past one year that Trend Micro went through this journey of uh, we transform ourselves from a software release. Usually software company, we have like 18 months release cycle. You will finish one, one version, you will throw it over to the salespeople and then Bye bye. The developer don't know what's going on mm. in the side. But this year, we really embraced this DevOps, and a lot of our products, including like our TrendX engine, which is using AI in real time, you can know which file from customers' environment is possible of causing damage. Or we have this uh, very famous uh, virus buster check which is in Taiwan, we call it Hang Zha Da Yuan. Thank you, Audrey, for helping that group and, and posting the uh, recommendation. Yeah, business for Weekly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just Business Weekly. <laughs> Just that. Yeah. And, uh, um, so those are the important things that we learned that using DevOps, you can get closer to customer and respond and in our cybersecurity business, most important thing, give timely protection mm -hmm. for our customers. Mm -hmm. so. I see. Audrey, from your response, I can tell that you're very aware of this DevOps concept and method, right? Yeah. Uh, I used to be an agile coach. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was still am within the government. And then, then did, you, did you see their work, their hard work in putting all this into application throughout the past years? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think the intrapreneurship, right, the kind of work that I'm doing within the cabinets, as well as the virus uh, buster team was doing within Trend Micro uh, has the same spirits, right? A small team of people recognize a new emerging need. Uh, people understand this is not just about spam and virus in emails, but also in end-to-end -end encrypted channels such as Line, uh, which is also popular in Japan, right? Uh, and uh, without uh, sacrificing security or privacy, uh, we uh, discovered the need that if people respond to the misinformation, the conspiracy theory, the scams, and so on, through volunteer participation, this is what we call uh, or everyone's business with everyone's help. And so this collective intelligence informed our response strategy and pivoted into a pretty good product, uh, the virus buster uh, in Trend Micro's case. I see. Yeah. I, I, yes. I, I'm of course. I, Eva, go ahead. I, I'm also the thing, so I. Want to <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, see, our question is that what is the challenge of uh, DevOps process, mm -hmm. right? And um, even within our company, we are a private company, and uh, we should be able to control everything. But right. mm -hmm. the biggest challenge is data silo. Right. Each mm -hmm. department has their own data, and uh, it's very hard to connect all this data. 
But I imagine that in government agency, this bureaucracy and that has <laughs> like, oh, of oh, course. Oh. So how did you overcome that? And for instance, the mask, uh, mm. within such a short time, you come up with the mask map. And how did you do that? Yeah. How did you break that silence? Mm. That's right. So uh, a, a very, very interesting approach that we take is so-called open government approach. Uh, in Mandarin, you call it which is very difficult to translate, uh, to build a car behind open doors, maybe. <laughs> 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 right. So the idea, very simply put, uh, is not to connect those silos arbitrarily, but rather ask those silos, is there a way for you to publish the data as soon as you collect the data to the open? So instead of uh, silos exchanging data behind closed doors, they actually exchange data behind open doors. Uh, in terms of the mask availability, for example, is the individual pharmacies agreeing to publish the real-time availability data every 30 seconds. Imagine if they send the data back to the NHI and the NHI review it manually and publish every day, then everyone will have to trust the NHI as a third party. How, uh, trust. However, mm -hmm. uh, when the pharmacies agree to publish as soon as they're collected, then it's a participatory accountability, meaning people queuing in line after they see someone swipe their national health card, they can actually see on their phone uh, using maybe Jiguanjia, a line bot or something mm. that the uh, availability decreased in real time so that it de decreased by two and two and two initially. Nowadays it's by 10 and 10 and 10. Uh, but if it rather increases, uh, people will call 1922 right there, right? So because of this rapid response cycle, this is not about someone integrating those data manually, but rather uh, asking them to publish soon as they collect. Wow. Mm. It, yes, Eva, you pick up the word trust right. uh, within this conversation. How do you uh, enhance trust between teams in terms of private sector and how do you enhance trust between different government sectors? That's um, very interesting too. I, I think uh, I, I want to borrow your word. Yes. It's very hard to translate, but it's open door. That's right. Right, mm -hmm. I think open door probably is the way to, to uh, build the trust, right? Probably you can illustrate more about this part. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, when I joined the cabinet, there is already an open data policy, but I upgraded it into real-time open data uh, and gave it a moniker open API using the open API standard. Uh, I think it's a Linux foundation standard uh, 3.0. And because we share the same standard, uh, people come to rely on each other for service delivery. And when people fulfill those service delivery a APIs like a contract over time, then people understand uh, what is better if they develop themselves and what is better if they just make sure that everyone can build upon the same API. A case in example, initially the mask availability is in the form of maps, but for people with seeing difficulties, maps is not very friendly. Uh, and so line bots, voice assistants, um, many other uh, ways of doing things, actually more than 140 different ways of doing things started to, to come. And uh, whenever someone say, why there's no American English version, uh, we're like, here's the API, build one and why there is no uh, indigenous Amis version uh, will uh, build one, right? Okay. So basically by saying, ni xing ni lai, if you can build, you build it. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we ensure that we trust the citizens and the citizens trust us. Right, but <laughs> when you do this uh, open door, uh -huh. Don't you face a lot of question about the security, the data safety? Mm. Definitely. Uh, and because of that, we make a very clear delineation. The national health insurance data is not part of the public internet. It's behind VPN, behind its yeah. own uh, network. On the other hand, the public data set, the open data data set is on the public internet and also replicated across more than 140 different de citizen developers. And in a sense, it's almost like a distributed ledger in a sense that if we modify it, everybody would know, right? right. Uh, and so because of that trust, it's much more easily verified uh, when it's replicated across many development groups. But of course, the central operation technology that, of course, is not connected to the public internet. Right. So I think uh, it's like a, in security field, we say, if you want mm. to have trust, first, you need to start with zero trust. Definitely. Yes. Zero yes. trust. Yeah, zero means trust. Means that you need to verify. Verify first, first and then, then trust. That you can That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Audrey, you are one of the most high profile uh, digital minister across Asia, if not across the world. I know you have great publicity in French, uh, German as well, uh, but before government officials from Japan. My next question will be, uh, you've moved so much different digital policy throughout the past four, four years so far. Which one is the most memorable one for you? And you think it's so meaningful and I did the right decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think one of the key decisions that we made, and it's not just me, but also Premier uh, Lai Ching De and Su Chen Chen, also the Minister of Sub Portfolio Lo Bing Chen, but uh, Angola Ziyutaka, but collectively we made a decision to counter the infodemic, that's the disinformation crisis, that's the uh, conspiracy theories and so on, without administrative takedown. Now, this is actually very unique because mostly in Asia, when people see there's a disinformation crisis, the intuition is to enable the cabinet to be able to take down uh, messages from the public internet so it doesn't spread and so on. This is like a, a lockdown in yeah, pandemic. Yeah. Uh, we're not saying it's not useful, but it does hurt the trustworthiness uh, between the social groups. And it also makes other sort of solutions very difficult to grow. Once you have a lockdown, people just stay at home and there's no way for social organizations to build, right? Yeah. And so uh, just like lockdowns, we make sure that we counter the infodemic with no takedown by relying on, for example, the third party fact checkers uh, that Trend Micro works with, right? <laughs> Through the virus bus and so on. And so this is like asking people to contribute more, to uh, wear a mask, to wash their hands, uh, to share good hygienic practices and so on, so that it actually reinforces democracy rather that concentrates more power into the administration. And so this, uh, what we call the people public private partnership model, uh, starting with people, the social sector, the media, mm -hmm. the fact checkers and so on, and moving on to the public sector without taking down from the private sector. I mm -hmm. think this is one of the more memorable choices that we made. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes, this is excellent. That deserves a round of applause. I yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think this is the attitude that that's one of the, at least one of the big reasons that Trend Mike, uh, I mean, Taiwan is like immune mm -hmm. from the whole world. Yeah, and, and it's yeah. so important for the whole world to get this message. Right. Eva, as a company leader and CEO, how do you lead Trend Micro to combat COVID throughout 2020? Because as far as I know, you guys level up when everybody is taking a huge hit. Yeah, actually, I must say, I always say we are lucky because we are totally relying on digital. We are a global company. So we rely on digital communication a lot. So when COVID-19 happened and we all need to work from home, actually it's uh, less challenge mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Trend Micro. But I must say one thing that is really impressive, which is our Philippine operating operation center. They were the call centers. Call centers usually is like a bunch of people need to sit there mm. receiving the calls, right? And uh, Philippines don't have very good infrastructure. Right. But within three days, our whole thousand support people mm. take their computer from office back to home, set it up and answer during all this one year, they all work from home. Our customer satisfaction did not drop at all. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. So I think wow. uh, that is probably like you say, they trust, I believe the power is in those people. They feel they have a mission. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. believe they are doing something that is important. Mm -hmm. When, you know, during the COVID-19, yeah. um, immediately we think one, one month, we see 260% increase in Phil's uh, phishing email. Mm, that's right. Just mm -hmm. All this bad guy trying to utilize this opportunity to, mm -hmm. to grab the money, right? Mm -hmm. So we all very angry about those bad guys. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the sheer mission that we have that I think uh, enable people to do the right thing. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, uh, since we have limited time, my final question, uh, since we're on safety issues and data privacy, I think it's so important when we're into the new norm for the following years, I suppose. So both from your experience from public sector and your experience from private sector, what's government's role in this and what's her vision about enhance the whole Taiwan, especially uh, data 
uh, protection, data privacy. And as a company, you provide solution to the whole world. What's your vision and what's your, uh, the next step, vision throughout the whole space? Okay. Sure. So uh, what we will do definitely uh, is in order to make sure that privacy is designed into all the government digital services, we have published, for example, the government digital service guidelines or the GDSG, as well as working with, uh, the, for example, the European Union on the GDPR adequacy. Uh, and that will definitely enhance uh, the protection uh, and the kind of psychological safety, not just the uh, cybersecurity safety, which is of course the foundation, uh, but also the secure by default arrangement so that when people feel that their privacy uh, may be compromised, there is a reliable way to get uh, what really is happening uh, to the people. I think uh, we, I will use one one example uh, in uh, consumer right protection. Mm. In Taiwan, when you buy something uh, over an e-commerce shop, uh, you're entitled to seven or 10 or 14 days uh, of uh, trial period. Uh, and if you don't like what's being delivered to your house, you can just repackage it and send it back and, and get a refund. Now, this is protected by the Consumer Protection Council. And people understand generally that if a website says that by clicking this by default, you forfeit the chance uh, to try for uh, seven days or 10 days or whatever, that's actually null and void. It doesn't mean anything. You can still return that because it's protected uh, by law. And if there's any uh, tensions uh, arise from this kind of uh, labeling, people know that they can call the consumer protection officials, the Xiaobao Guan uh, system, mm. uh, that then uh, will uh, fight for them <laughs> uh, to get a fair treatment and so on. So we need a very similar arrangement for privacy protection, for personal data protection. And that is what we are are now focusing on. Mm, I see. It's clear. Yeah. Eva, I have a statistic here. Uh, for, the, for the past year, uh, Trend Micro has become a thousand and six million US dollar company. That is a world leading brand. And as I suppose, uh, uh, safety data and safety garden, this is such, such a cool thing and technical thing. How do you transfer into a warm brand and provide solution to the whole world and moving forward? What's your vision? I think for cybersecurity company, the most important brand is trust. And I kept on saying that uh, for 33 years now, mm -hmm. since we founded the company, we do nothing but cybersecurity, right? And so uh, customer trust us, uh, I think is the business model is very important. If um, one hand is selling data and one hand is trying to do data security, that's not trustworthy, right? So uh, I think, uh, that um, sometimes I call Tremicro a very single-minded company. We just very persistently doing cybersecurity. But I'd like to uh, mention something about sure. um, post-COVID-19 um, sure. um, security. I think this uh, pandemic actually accelerated the digital transformation in a lot of sectors, right? So many people, no matter it's work from home, study from home, or uh, the smart factory or even smart car, smart construction infrastructure, mm -hmm. all of this is accelerating into the digital platform. Mm -hmm. But what it means to security is it widen the, uh, we call it attack service. There's so many places that the attacker can attack. They can mm -hmm. attack from the home office into the, the enterprise, they can attack from the, the uh, say, smart meter, mm -hmm. right? The smart grid, smart meter, and then attack the country's infrastructure. So there's a lot more that we need to do to protect this widened um, attack surface and correlate all this data, like, like mm -hmm. you mentioned. Sometimes we need to understand how is the traffic no, normal data, right? We, we get it from government. What is the traffic pattern? Then we can analyze that somebody is hacking that, that traffic light to, to making a, a, a different pattern, right? So I think um, it's a very important thing for mm -hmm. cybersecurity and working with the government sector because uh, we think uh, our specialty is cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Government has a lot of these uh, citizenships data and citizens' uh, infrastructure. Yes. 
and this that has uh, interchange and, and collects, like you say, people, private, public, or combined right. together. That's right. Yeah. Our president Tsai Ing-wen has a saying that cybersecurity is a matter of national security yes. and Ji Guan for precisely this point. Right. Thank you for sharing. My time is up and right now it's open floor. If you guys want to raise your questions, uh, do we have the QR code here so people can scan uh, through Slido? Uh, uh, right now, if you have any questions that you would like to raise, Audrey here has this iPad. So if you raise any questions to Slido and, 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 and also Eva can, can see some of the questions. To see the QR code, click the hamburger on the top left side, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then uh, in presentation mode. Wow. <laughs> Please use a phone and scan the QR code here if you have questions to raise. Right now is the perfect timing. Presentation mode in the top left corner. Then the second one. The second one. The second one. Time for the teacher time. Please use it. It's very difficult. Right. No, because they're they're uh, putting up this for us to see, and so I was yes. just asking them to to share it in presentation mode. Found it. Found it. All right. So we're now waiting for them. Okay. Now, please, if you have questions, okay, let's give them some time. Okay, to type. this is what we call Chen Luan Gao Bai. The first first question is to Audrey. How she? I see Delu. All right. Audrey, I know your style is you will pick the question and you will answer, right? Because yeah. it's, it's, it's more... <laughs> right, right, right. That's right. So, so yes, uh, I, I like you all. Thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, Jen Michael cannot come too much. <laughs> that's, right, that's right, that's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, I use the green vines, uh, Lu Teng Sheng Ji, uh, for, <laughs> for, my, for my hair product. <laughs> but for body wash, I use cha zi tang. Okay. Cha zi tang, cha zi tang. Yo, make you touch her. From all online audience, they're they're asking what shampoo does Audrey use. All right. All right. There's more serious question now. Who is birthday today? Okay. Are you famous for singing? No, not really. Oh, okay. <laughs> not really. Not really. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah, there, there's a more serious question. Can okay, we, can let, we get let's, that? Let's, let's go to that. <laughs> okay. Right. So there's a question that says, in many countries, there is a mistrust between the citizens, the industry, and the government. How does Taiwan get everyone trusting each other? Wow, so so the, key, the key is the government need to trust the citizen first, and then the citizen may trust back. But but yeah, may or may not, right? <laughs> it's beyond us, right? But 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 how? What what do I mean by trust in a citizen? Uh, there's two, the most important two things. The first uh, is to publish the data as soon as we have the data, to make sure that there is no time lag between the data collection to the state and the data publication, so that everybody can verify uh, what really is happening. The other thing is accountability. It's very hard to translate in Mandarin, so I usually translate to uh, right, to be able to account for something. So for example, when mask rationing first started to roll out, there's a social innovation that displays the real-time map, right? But there's also another social innovation from pharmacies to hand out those how map, take a number system. Now, these two individually are very good innovation, but taken together, this is like Mentos plus Coca-Cola. It explodes because for the uh, pharmacy that hand out those numbers at the morning and asking you to take the mask at the evening, it looks on the map like it sells nothing for a while. And during lunch breaks, it sells everything, right? <laughs> and so the numbers stop being accurate. Uh, and so when we discovered this issue uh, on February the 6th, the first thing uh, the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center and, and, and uh, yours truly did is to apologize. 
is to say, sorry, we, we didn't think of this. Uh, and to the pharmacist saying, whatever you're doing is right, we support you. And whatever we were doing wrong, we will fix it next Thursday. And so we started at the time establishing an iteration cycle that's weekly. And so everybody come to realize that all the rules, all the regulations, all the algorithms and so on are up to uh, patch welcome, right? Everyone can send uh, new ideas to the CECC. So the very next week, we fix that by having the opening hour split into two different data fields, one for collecting number and one for collecting mask. And then a week afterward, we invented ways to, for example, to disappear from the map, <laughs> right? Uh, if the pharmacy hands out all the numbers, they can just press the button and disappear from the map and so on. So after three or four iterations, then we start to do uh, a pivoting on pre-ordering and things like that. And so at any time, people understand that it's not their fault to come up with social innovation. It's it's always our fault, and our uh, commander Chen Shizong has a great way of saying it, uh, which is uh, right? legislator teach us. Right? <laughs> and so uh, whenever anyone wants to offer anything, we just turn those complaints into co-creation the very next Thursday by providing accountability, oh, and that's a yeah. key. Yeah, I just want to say in your this sentence, you speak everything about that ball, mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. because I think that the most difficult thing for engineer or for any person is to admit I am wrong. That's right. That's right. And always, a lot of time, we will say, customer, how do, how come you so stupid? How do you use it works the for me? It way? works for me, right? Right, it's not my fault, it's your fault. So I think in your process, the first most important thing you say, mm -hmm. It's my fault. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I would try to understand why why this is not fitting your your mm -hmm. way and. Is next week. Yeah, I would we'll change. fix it next Thursday. Yeah, every time we fix it next Thursday. Right. So I think it's perfect. Your description just is the devil of mentality. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Right now we cannot see the screen here, but give you guys a little bit time so uh, we can see all the question above. I see there's a very important one. Can we go back a little bit? There's. There's one called, yes. uh, yeah. So there's one that says, do you think there are still areas that we can improve on how we deal with misinformation, the so-called fake news that is still apparent uh, in a society? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think in the long run, uh, misinformation really is just a symptom. Uh, and uh, the root cause is that people are still in a mindset of being readers, consumers, viewers of radio and television. Now that there's nothing wrong with that because it was born in the age of mass media. But nowadays in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. No matter where you are in Taiwan, you get 10 megabits per second and bi-directionally at just uh, less than $500 uh, per month. Uh, and because of that, everyone is media. Everyone produces media. Uh, and because of that, we are not teaching media literacy only anymore. We're now teaching media competence, meaning that we mm -hmm. understand the primary schoolers, uh, my grandma, and so on. Everyone, our media producers, and everyone need to understand their social responsibility as a media producer to balance their data sources, their information sources, to participate more in fact-checking and things like that. So when we see a lot of middle schoolers and so on fact-checking our three presidential candidates um, a year ago uh, during their platform debates and so on, uh, I'm very excited by that because that means that those primary schoolers are not just listeners of media, they are now actively participating in newsroom. So that's the one thing I think uh, we can do. Eva, just the same question. Do you think there are still areas we can prove in terms of how to deal with cybersecurity? Same question. Oh, there's so many things that we can participate, we, we can improve in cybersecurity. But uh, at least one thing, uh, yes. as long as your president don't don't spread uh, fake news. <laughs> oh. Our president don't. The middle schoolers <laughs> fact check all three candidates and she doesn't do that. president somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next question, I saw one that's a little bit above. I think that's so interesting, a little bit political. Mm -hmm. AWS stopped Polar due to some reason, political reasons. And do you think, Audrey, I think it's a great question. Do you think Taiwan's infrastructure use cloud solutions from other countries might be a risk? 
Yeah, for, for example, our uh, National Center for High-Speed Computation, uh, that's the entire stack down to the metal uh, is uh, within our territory. Uh, and we also make sure that, of course, we still work with other cloud provider solutions on reusing the open source components, but we always make sure that those open source components are understood and deployed uh, domestically. And I, really, that's the, the only responsible way of doing uh, public service, because when we build public service on third party infrastructure and if they go down, they have their own SLA. They are not accountable to the taxpayers. So for the truly important parts of digital services and so on, we always make sure that those cloud infrastructure providers are domestic or at least have a domestic presence and can have the SLA agreements that is in response uh, to the digital service actual need and also uh, is subject to the same cybersecurity standards as the competent authority, the ministries or agencies contract out those services. I think really that's the only responsible action. Right, and uh, from a cybersecurity yes. expert, uh, I would say um, actually it's impossible that you want to say it's totally safe. You want to stop all the risk. Mm -hmm. So actually the most important thing for any organization is to assume that you will have a breach right. and then prepare your risk uh, mitigation. To be resilient. Right, yes. to be resilient so, so you can uh, react fast and limit your damage. Mm -hmm. That is even more important. Mm -hmm. Audrey, what do, do you want to pick the next question that you would love to sure. respond? Um, so the next question is, how do you motivate people to have a shared vision towards the same urgency um, with really cute dogs? Uh, in the uh, Taiwan counter pandemic playbook, which is the SARS playbook, uh, we noted in 2003, the main difficulty in communication was that uh, there's no centrally identifiable trustworthy communication source in the in 2003, mm -hmm. the municipal government, the central government, the media were all saying very different things. Uh, and so the Central Epidemic Command Center currently uh, works with the Ministry of Health and Welfare's Participation Officer, or PO. There's a team of people within each ministry in charge of engaging the public. And the MOHW PO actually lives with a very cute dog. The name is called Zong Chai. It's a <laughs> Shiba Inu. Uh, and this uh, cute dog uh, becomes this official Spokesdog of the entire CECC communication strategy. For example, uh, we would say to keep social distance, the physical distancing, indoor, keep three Shiba Inus away, outdoor, two Shiba Inus away, otherwise wear a mask. And the uh, dog very cutely uh, put a foot to its mouth uh, in a picture that says, uh, uh, wear a mask to uh, avoid xiadao How do I translate that? <laughs> to, to, um, <laughs> to, to avoid putting your, your hand to your mouth, I guess. Right? So a mask protect your own face against your own hands. Now, yeah. that's a message very much worth spreading, and anyone who has seen this cute dog will uh, virally <laughs> share this message so that people understand wearing a mask is a matter of personal protection. It's mm -hmm. not just about, or even it's not primarily about respecting the elderly or respecting right. uh, the frontline workers or respecting each other, which is all very good and well, but people don't tend to share that kind of message. So yeah. <laughs> cute dog, sharing a message that appeals to rational self-interest that's the most important thing yeah actually chen micro also have a famous dog yeah Qi du Chen. that's right that's right <laughs> yeah, the virus buster is also yeah, a very cute a, dog it's a dog <laughs> that's right that's right so you see cute dog <laughs> cute dog works uh, audrey i've been in media industry for the past 10 years and i think using tai chen this is such a phenomenal and, and, and good decision but before the decision being made, how do you know it's gonna work? Why is not a bird? Why is not a cartoon or mermaid? How, how do you decide on this? Well, it just so happens that the participation officer lives with a Shiba Inu instead of with a mermaid. I, I don't know any no. official that lives with a mermaid, but anyway, so, uh, so it, it's cheaper actually uh, because <laughs> they, they don't have to pay Shutterstock Patents, right, 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 <laughs> or play right, right. Disney or, cheaper, or things cheaper. like that, right? They just go back home because they live very close to the main building of the ministry. So whenever there's a new like physical distancing rule and things like that, uh, the PO just walks back home, take new picture of the dog and post it on social media. <laughs> <laughs> so saves a bunch of licensing fees. Right.
For, for Japanese government officials, they might have to choose a different animal. Otherwise, it will cause confusion, <laughs> I think. I don't know. I mean, I mean, we have a dog uh, in Trend Micro. There's a dog in uh, Yan Chiu Zhongyang Dian Shi Tai, right? The Shen Shou Yu Zi, right? There's multiple Ooh. Shiba Inus in Taiwanese media, and, and they coexist right. happily. Right. Yeah. Let's move to the next question. Yeah, sure. Um, right. So, yes, the, the next one says, uh, so uh, this morning uh, in our cabinet meeting, uh, we have decided uh, that we will first pass a specific act for digital identity card before rolling out the digital identity card. And this is very interesting because to me, uh, it shows that the cybersecurity awareness and privacy awareness has really grown during the year of the pandemic. Previously, there's uh, not even half a million people downloading the National Health Insurance app, the Jiankang Zhe. But now it's, I think, more than 5 million, 6 million, something like that. Uh, it's actually the most popular app uh, in both Google Play uh, and App Store in Taiwan for the past whole year. And because of that, people understood now more about uh, how to check for the lawful use of their national health insurance card, mm. how to check the diagnosis uh, from the hospitals and clinics they visit, how to even download the x-rays uh, directly from the app and so on. And so naturally the expectation to the national ID card has risen because of this experience. So I think it's a really good thing. I think it, uh, we do have a duty to make an act that's at least as secure uh, and as privacy preserving as the national health card before we roll out the ID. But, but you must need to have a lot of courage to stop a project like that, right? That's right, that's right. So. This is why uh, we call uh, in Mandarin here, we call pivot zhou zhuan, right? So first you have a shared vision, you have a shared value and that's your zhou, right? That, that's your pillar. And then you can rotate alongside this pillar. And we can say, yeah, our main pillar is to make sure that everyone feels safe, that cybersecurity and privacy is preserved. And that's our job, that's our pillar. And yes. then we rotate saying, okay, nowadays people are saying this must be at least as secure <coughs> as, as the National Health Card. And so we, we, we just do that, right? So this is again, a pivot much like how we uh, told the pharmacists, hey, you, you have it right, we got it wrong. And we will remedy that next Thursday. Right, right. And Exactly, and I'm a, I'm a basketball fan, and I used to use this uh, example. I always say, uh, yeah. when you get the basketball, uh, you can only have two legs. That's right, that's right, right. yes. You, you can only have one leg. That's right, that's right. Yes. That's what you say. Pivot. That's right, that's right, one exactly. One leg is on your mission, on that's your right. mission. But that's right. how do you find the right direction? Right. A mission-oriented pivot. Yeah, yeah. A mission-oriented pivot, metaphor. that's right. exactly right. All right, the next question is so interesting. I want to focus on this a little bit more. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the government is looking for a cybersecurity PhD expert, PhD. Uh, why don't you, would you ever consider to work directly with we Trend Micro? We are working with Trend Micro. <laughs> <laughs> Can just uh, collaborate with us and don't yes. don't try to recruit my. That's engineer, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I I'm not in a HR function here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but more seriously, uh, I think there needs to be cybersecurity expertise in all levels of the agency, yes. not just the one or two doctors who are, of course, very important to safeguard the agency. But equally important is that every level of officials need to understand that cybersecurity is not just about something that uh, you pay attention to after something bad happens. Yes. It needs to be designed upfront. You need to invite this um, white hat thinking, uh, red team and things like that even before you roll out your first digital service and so I think equally important is the competence of all levels of officials and in Taiwan uh, we thank Trent Michael for showing uh, what truly uh, contributions from the white hat community could be uh, to the national security and uh, we are now looking to uh, promote more of that especially to young people right yes. there's AIS 3 from the Ministry of Education yes. and we're looking to expand that even more so that the parents will feel safe safe if their uh, child says, hey, I'm going to be a white hat hacker, <laughs> and the parents will not panic. That is also wow. very important. <laughs> Got it. All yeah. right. Our time is up. And thank you so much for uh, the question that you've raised. I think Audrey is online all the time. If you do have so many questions, maybe you can find a way to talk to her directly. All right. Uh, oh, I've been told they have five minutes. So maybe Whoa. one more question. Yay. Okay, one more question. Okay. One more question. Right. 
So uh, the last question uh, is actually a complex one. Uh, Masaya san would like to know, there are digital transformation failures in Japan over the last few years. How does the Taiwanese government help companies secure their digital transformation? Um, so uh, to, uh, I would not comment on the first uh, sentence, but the second <laughs> part <laughs> of it, uh, I, I think it's by really by making sure that our failure modes are public. That is to say, to fail fast and loudly. Um, in, in Taiwan, for example, the mask rationing example, we actually had a prototype uh, that people didn't see uh, that was uh, using mobile payment instead of the national health card uh, that's uh, initially at the convenience stores. And we didn't roll it out, uh, especially uh, early on, because we understood that people trust the pharmacies more. And we also know that only around half of the population understand how to use mobile payments. And so if we roll it out as the first version, then we will not get three quarter of the population uh, getting access to masks and washing their hands properly because they heard it from their trusted pharmacists, right? Um, and so we kind of deliberately let the first version fail because we understand that we need to serve a higher purpose. And later on, when we introduce pre-ordering at a convenience store, again, the first prototype is actually using automated teller machines or ATMs where you can insert your uh, bank card or post office card and type in uh, passwords uh, and wire 52 uh, anti dollars uh, and get this QR code that you can then redeem the mask uh, on the same store next week. But we didn't roll it out again because of the feedback, especially from the elderly population, told us that they're very wary to enter their password to the ATM. They will think that someone, right? Because it says that uh, this counter scam uh, sticker, uh, 165, right. is on the ATM all the time. Right, they're right. very afraid <laughs> right. that they will just wire out their entire saving uh, just to right. buy some mask, right? Uh, and so because of that, we pivoted again and say, instead using the national health card and pay cash, mm -hmm. uh, like wow. literally, coins uh, at a desk. Uh, wow. The convenience stores didn't really like that because wow. it's it's very unlikely for them to impose by something when you pay by cash. But on the other hand, this really secured the psychological safety right. for the elderly people and so on. So we didn't hide <clears throat> the two failed prototypes from the society, from the population. Instead, we talk about these failure modes um, all the time. We share uh, whatever we have uh, thought of and how we didn't uh, implement something and that, I think, lead by example in a way of digital transformation, that people would then think about digital transformation as something that really um, saves time, mm. improves quality, mm. and also builds trust yeah. instead of just chasing some shiny new technologies at the expense of trust and so on. It's so refreshing to hear from a highly technical savvy person <laughs> from government say mm. that don't just Think about the shining technology. Right. Think about the customers failing, right. right? You talk about these older people mm -hmm. feel, feel of safe. Mm -hmm. That is so refreshing to hear. And I think that's the lesson probably all of us should learn. It's too much time. We technology people mm -hmm. just feel like that's the right. newest shining technology mm -hmm. is good, but how to implement it? That's right. It's all about the users, yes. right? Thank you, Eva, for wrapping this up, and thank you guys for sharing. And this is definitely the time's up. Uh, would you to please stand up and come hey. with me? Because Trend Micro has prepared a little Hi. gift. Come with me a little bit so that they can present the gifts. And they put a lot of thoughts into the gifts, and that is going to, uh, to Audrey here. So later on, we will be having a group pictures. Uh, thank you guys for participating in Micro Master Forum. And right now, let's present this gift here. <laughs> and thank you guys uh, from Japan. That's the end of our webinar. Thank you so much for your participation. All right, right now we're going to take a group photo together.